Two minutes to go, you're in demand, Dr. Mortimer. So far, we have 66 people in the waiting room. That's very terrifying. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> That's great. One minute to go. I forgot to take a reminder to uh, hit record before we start. All right, uh, admitting all participants in five, four, three, two, one.
Resilience is the ability to persist over time. In the Manila Bay and other bays uh, that experience red tides, it is the marginalized that is affected in health and in economy. The engineering is the ability to absorb, thrive, and then recover. Uh, the faster you are able to recover, the more resilient. Sa Pilipino, ito ay katibayan at katatagan sa mahirap na sitwasyon at ang kakayahang bumangon muli. Yung ecological naman, the ability to adapt. Yung evolution of resilience vale to really innovate and be creative. Resilience is really being able to spring back from adversity, but it should have learning and therefore it strengthens you to be more resilient than before the adversity came to you. Before COVID-19, the Philippines was already on to SMT-based measures to improve its resilience capacity. With COVID, the country was awakened to the need for resilience of our economic, health, and educational status as well. The country as a whole is, I think, not so resilient because while we have the capabilities, the opportunities, and the resources to cope with COVID-19, the whole body is suffering because the leadership and management is not working so well. When it comes to individual resilience, those who have more resources, capabilities, and opportunities will be more resilient than those who are not. A lot of the problems really may be interconnected, Bale. You have to look at it from a holistic point of view. It encompasses more than natural sciences or physical problem, Bale, but also it gets into the ecological, biological, as well as social. Among issues and problems we have, are poverty, ecosystem destruction, climate change, and variability. Much of our attention is placed only after the disasters happen. What we should do really is to take early action years before the hazard strikes, and we should put our attention and our resources into that type of planning. We need SMT-based transdisciplinary and inclusive approach to coping with possible hazards. The fragmentation of society needs to be resolved for resilience. Communication is very, very important. And we should communicate to the people using not just uh, scientific communication means, but through arts, music. Uh, understand the mindset of the Filipino people so we can communicate better. Well, the way to move forward is interoperability. So we have to do a lot of work as a person, as a community, and as an institution to really have resilience as one of the values of the Filipinos. Yung tunay na resilience na towards uh, improvement. Building resilience requires sustainable design inspired by transdisciplinary approach. To be sustainable, you have to be resilient. To be resilient, you have to be sustainable. Go natural. Go with nature's flow. Non-structural or natural interventions, as well as good planning, is the most sustainable. Finally, we need to harness and strengthen the Filipino spirit of Bayanihan. Pero dahil kami ay 
nasa academic o pinag-aaralan natin, natin, natin ang mga... Ito talaga ang kailangan natin na only for ourselves, but for a people of all. Resilience ng mga Pilipino towards the collective effort among communities and the strengthening of... Resilience Live. Hello everyone! Good afternoon! And I'm happy to announce that we are now on our sixth episode of the Resilience Live webinar, Exploring Geo Heritage for Resilience Building. Again, my name is Ella and I will be your host for today. To start our program, the Resilience Live webinar series is brought to you by the UP NOAA Center and the UP Resilience Institute in cooperation with the UNESCO International Geoscience Program or IGCP. Together, the UP NOAA Center and IGCP seek to explore geo heritage as a tool for developing resilience to natural hazards. Our partners for today's episode are the Lyceum of the Philippines Laguna Biological Society, the UPLB Interdisciplinary Studies Center for Integrated Natural Resources and Environment Management, or UPLB INREM, the Association of Filipino Forestry Students of UPLB, or at UPLB, the UP Volcano Tectonics Laboratory, and the UP Rockhound. So, our speaker for today works as a Deputy Academic Dean at the Lancaster University in the United Kingdom and the Beijing Jiaotong University in China through the Transnational Education Collaboration. She also spent 12 years as a production manager across the UK, particularly in cultural change management. She is also an expert on organizational behavior within the international arena. Her research works include community leadership as well as community-led disaster planning and resilience with emphasis on traditional knowledge, as well as decolonizing the curriculum and humanities thinking in business management teaching and learning. Here to discuss her presentation on what is the role of geoheritage in the Anthropocene, seeking out the leadership challenges of the 21st century, Dr. Kristin Mortimer. Hello everyone. It's real, real pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, and can I please thank April for uh, doing my um, uh, presentation, moving the slides forward. Um, I was really interested in watching the film uh, that started uh, this lecture. And it brings together many of the points that I want to make uh, through this session. And really it's around one of the chief problems we have is that we need to start bringing people together. We need to start developing uh, a mesh of relationships between the many different uh, stakeholders that are now coming into play as we move forward in the 21st century to try and solve some of the very critical problems that we're facing. In that film, we saw a huge amount of diversity. We saw, we heard many, many different perspectives, many different ideas about how problems can be solved, particularly those around resilience and sustainability. Um, many different needs and wants from people and what their expectations are of how we move forward. And the question for leadership is how do we start to really bring all of these ideas together so that there's a co-creation in the way that we move forward. And I think one of the speakers in the video said it, you know, we have many opportunities, um, but is uh, the leadership and the management does not currently seem to be working. And one of the things I want to explore in the next 30 minutes is why that might be and how we might go about solving it. But as with all these problems, um, it is never easy. Um, so at the end, I'm very, very happy to take questions. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So very quickly, this is the contents. So I'm not going to go through it. It's just to give you a, a quick overview of some of the areas that I'm going to be covering. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I was became very interested uh, whilst putting together a module for my students. And I was watching a um, documentary by David Attenborough called A Life on This Planet. And when I started to think about it, I was born in the 1960s, in the early 1960s. 
Um, and in the Western world, that was the age of flower power and uh, people power, really, and, and all about love and hope and looking forward. At that time, the world population was three billion people and the wild places on the planet accounted for 62% of the world land mass. And it's those wild places really that for me form part of this idea of geo heritage. And geo heritage has a really important place as we move forward because it helps us with our understanding of how this planet works. Um, particularly when you're looking at ancient forests, for example, um, there are uh, through science, we can discover a huge amount of what our planet was like in the past and how perhaps we can recover um, some of the um, some of the damage uh, that we have been um, we have been putting on the planet over the past hundred years. The other big problem we have is that although there is a lot of um, uh, many, many different issues around climate change, global warming, uh, the way that we are polluting the sea, the way we're polluting the land. We have a bigger problem, which is a social problem, and it's to do with us as people. The world population, um, when I was born, was 3 billion. Now it's 7.8 billion. That was in 2021. I checked last night on the World Meters uh, info site, and as of today, at I think I did this at 12 o'clock, uh, is 8.09428129 billion people and counting. So we have a problem with population, with the human population. And the human population, as it grows, it requires more resource, more land, more places to live, more food, more water, more oxygen. And this is what puts um, places that are deemed as being geo heritage places at risk. And those wild places now account for only 32% of the world's land mass. So we need to really think through how we bring together the different stakeholders in order to start addressing some of these problems. Next slide, please. So this is our world at the moment. Um, and we are suffering a, a lot of social strife. As human beings, we are finding it very difficult to get on with each other. Um, we can see many, many areas of uh, war, of antagonism happening across the globe. Uh, we also see um, a lot of problems around social justice uh, happening across the world. We see bigger gaps between richer and poorer. Uh, we have water stress um, across many parts of the world. We have food stress across many parts of the world. Um, and we have climate um, action taking place, uh, which is adding to the chaos that we currently live in. Next slide, please. So I think um, the Americans coined this term in um, 19, uh, 2007, and uh, it's the term avuca world, and it means basically that we live in a world at the moment that is very volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Next slide, please. And to try and explain some of this, we need to think about how we think and how we consider the world. Uh, John Law um, came up with the, the idea that actually from a Western perspective, um, and that's specifically an Anglo-Western perspective. So we're thinking about uh, the UK, America, and parts of Europe. Um, we look at the world as being a one world world. There is only one world. And basically it runs along the lines of a linear logic. Um, it's reductionist and extractionist in the way that it views the planet. The planet is something to be controlled, uh, not to be lived with or lived alongside. Um, and uh, business and science, which are the two main technologies of power, if you like, that guide our lives, um, come from the holy, holy trinity of effectiveness, efficiency, and continual growth. Um, and once we understand that, we can then think, okay, so all of these systems of control, particularly science and business, in whatever form that takes, um, have a huge impact upon our social lives. But we need to understand that that's a power that is being used, because unless we can understand that as a power, we cannot think of other ways of looking at the way that we engage uh, with this planet that we live on. Max Neef, uh, I think, 
brought it together very nicely. Uh, he said, knowledge is only one of the roads, only one side of the coin. The other road, the other side of the coin is that of understanding. And I think it's the understanding that we now need to give ourselves time as a species uh, to catch up on. Um, because very often we pull particular levers um, being unaware of the consequences that might occur. The Industrial Revolution um, being one of them, actually, the use of coal to generate power, the use of oil to generate power. Um, next slide, please. Um, I wanted to put this in. So I was doing some work with my students um, on Wednesday and they were modeling uh, this intersection between ecology, economy and ethics, uh, their final year students. And it was to help them try and see um, that interlink that every problem that we face is a wicked problem. It has many, many intersections with other areas of our lives, not only our lives, but of the, the planet's life. And um, the students were, I liked this because the green bit is sort of like the nature, the natural world, the wild world. And there are giant figures that are protecting this wild world. But around this wild world, we see human activity and that wild world is gradually getting smaller. And I thought these students have actually sort of pinpointed um, one of our key um, challenges at the moment. And it is this idea of geo archaeology you know how do we protect these spaces when people don't really understand the importance of them uh, next slide please so donna haraway who's a, a feminist um, science uh, writer and philosopher um, she suggests that at the moment um, there are two primary ways that human beings think about our present and our future uh, the first one is through hope, which is that technology will somehow come to rescue, um, come to the rescue of its naughty but very clever children, which I think is right. We are very, very clever as a species, um, but perhaps we dabble too much with things we don't really understand. Uh, the other side of that coin is that many people feel a state of despair. They feel the game is over, we're too far gone down this path, and things um, are not going to be able to change. The argument that she's making is that actually neither hope nor despair can lead us forward. What we need to do is actively build relationships, and that's where leadership and management comes in. How do we, as leaders and as future leaders in this audience, how do we build these relationships that include the human and the non-human entities that are around us. And I think that's the challenge that we need to face. Um, and that's how we can get leadership working again in the future. Next slide, please. So why do we need to be thinking about all these things? And as I said at the very beginning of this presentation, it's because we have wicked problems to solve and they are challenging and they are not easy to solve. Um, there is always a very high degree of social complexity involved. Um, social issues are often at the root of all of the problems uh, that we see occurring around us. And if you follow uh, the um, ecology line, if you follow the economic line, if you follow the ethics line, and you follow it far enough back, you will find that there are social issues at the bottom of all of those problems. And those issues specifically are unseen and unaddressed by the one world thinking. So when we're thinking about linear processes, when we think about the way um, that we are taught to decontextualize problems, so you try and get rid of all the jetsam and the flotsam, i.e. the social issues, to actually get to the root of the problem, um, we're actually missing what actually is the root of the problem, which is us as human beings and the society and the aspirations that those societies have. Um, we also uh, look for very swift and profitable solutions um, that follow very time honored steps that we have used in the past. And again, swift and profitable solutions do not solve social issues. Next slide, please. So what we need to do <laughs> is, as most of the people in this audience, and I know this is preaching to the converted really, um, is that we need to encourage everybody to think about the planet as being a finite resource. 
and the fact that this planet is our only refuge uh, for both humans and non-humans. Um, this is all there is in the galaxy as far as we're currently aware. And we need to understand that the needs of science and business have to start taking account of all knowledges and all stakeholders, including the non-human. Um, because it's only by building relationships that understand the perspectives of everything and everyone that we can really start to move forward. Next slide, please. So we need a new way of thinking. We actually need to readdress the epistemological stances that we come from and say we need to engage with this world in a different way. And Autorio um, Escobar um, came up uh, with the idea of the pluriversal invitation. And what he's saying here is he wants us to go into a world in which other worlds coexist, um, where there's a need to embrace a collective or even a personal mindset change in order for us to affect change in the systemic systems and power systems that we have around us. So the pluriversal ideas are really centered on that alternative and traditional ways of knowing and living. Uh, some of the things that came up in the video right at the start of this lecture. Um, and allowing space for the, that difference to be valued. Um, and I think that's the important thing. There are things that we can learn and the past and past histories, past knowledges um, about the land, about the way we use the land are not static. They're not old fashioned. They're not, um, we've not moved beyond them. They actually change with time because these people, people live with these ideas and they adapt and change those ideas as the world around them adapts and changes. And those are the histories, those are the knowledges um, that currently I feel uh, we, we skip over, we miss. And beyond all of this, um, the pluriversal approach um, is an acceptance that academic disciplines need to integrate those other ways of knowing more in harmony uh, with the interdependencies that actually we have uh, both on the planet and within us as humans. Um, and I think that's also something uh, that is becoming lost um, as the world moves forward in whatever way it's currently moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. So within this new perspective, and it's things that we all talk about and we all know intrinsically, um, is that all stakeholders need to be involved. We need to somehow build a shared definition and understanding of whatever problem it is we're trying to solve. Um, and if we're thinking about geoheritage, it's how do we protect these very valuable um, pieces of land that still exist across the planet? We need to be able to identify concerns, relationships, expectations, beliefs of all those people. Um, we have to find a way to be able to define the present and look to a shared and desirable future. Um, we need to be thinking in systems, not as, as individual aspects. So it isn't just about geoheritage, it's how geoheritage fits into a much wider systems thinking framework, which also includes infrastructure, technology, the social, the political, the economic, and ultimately the environmental issues. All of those things interconnect and we have to be able to find a way of leading and managing all of that uh, in order to affect change. And then we need to find the relationships between all of those things. So it's not an easy task, it's a huge task. And again, it requires a very different way of us thinking about the problems that we are facing. Uh, next slide, please. So um, one of the things um, I've been looking at and playing with playing with over the last four or five years is this idea about relational leadership. And relational leadership comes from an understanding that it's the meshes of relationships that are absolutely fundamental to understanding and beginning to solve these very complex, wicked problems. And it's not just the relationships, but it's also the interactions that happen between different groups of people. Uh, 
you know, and how do we co-construct ultimately the story and the problem that we're trying to say, we're trying to solve. So it's about relating, co-creating, and from that emerges a beginning of an understanding of the systemic issue that is occurring around us. And probably most importantly, as a, as a leader, if you're trying to lead in this relational way, it's the importance of reflecting on practice, on practice of leading groups of people on an ongoing basis, uh, whether it's when you're actually with groups of people, but also after you've interacted with people. And it's that reflection, that continual circle of reflection that becomes really important, but that's also very time consuming and difficult to do, as I'm sure most people know. Next slide, please. So um, Carol Ford and Taylor um, have sort of developed quite a nice framework uh, that can help us uh, begin to practice this idea of relational leadership and help us begin to perhaps untangle um, some of the issues and challenges we face. And they call it framing, positioning and bridging. Next slide, please. So if we're thinking about framing, and we think about a photograph being taken. So it's about putting a situation into a perspective. Uh, so this is actually a photograph from the Tongass um, National Forest in Alaska. And a particular frame, the photographer has taken a particular angle. He's looked for a particular light, a particular instant, what is central to him as he's taking the photograph, what's in focus and what is outside of focus. So this, picture represents one frame of one person's perspective that they wanted to show of the Tongass um, National Forest. The Tongass National Forest has lakes, it has all sorts of things, but this was the picture that he wanted to take. And that's what we do when we're in conversation with each other. We take a very specific angle um, that we have curated in order to put forward our perspective. And again, we saw that in the film uh, right at the beginning of this lecture. If you go back and watch it again, you will see that everybody is framing their perspective in a very particular way, in the way that they want people to focus on what it is they want people to see or hear. Next slide, please. So if we're thinking about that in terms of a conversation, we all come to a conversation with our own frames, with our own specific frames. So here, again, we're looking at the Tongass rainforest, and I've chosen that specifically because it is an extremely important carbon sink uh, for America, and Donald Trump, in his wisdom, took away um, its safety net to stop logging. Uh, so it has been in the news quite a lot recently uh, with a promise to um, bring that safety net back into place. But if we think about that in context, we have um, the indigenous people who very much want to protect their rainforest uh, because of all the reasons they know and uh, the importance of the ecosystem that, that's there. We have all the animals who live within that ecosystem and can probably only live within that ecosystem. But we also have um, the men who work for logging companies. They have families uh, that this work supports. Um, and they also need forests to log in order to make money to look after their family. Local government needs money from the taxes that they pay. We also have the logging companies themselves who um, want to make money, who are businesses, um, and this is a resource that they can use. So just within this little tiny thing, we have four frames at work. And I suspect in any meeting that you have ever held, there will be at least four, if not more, different interests at play. And your role as a leader and any role as a leader is to try and understand each of those frames and then to enable each of the groups to start understanding each other's frames. And it's only once we get to that point that maybe, maybe we might be able to start moving things forward. But that in itself is a real skill. And I think it's a skill that um, isn't taught, isn't talked about, um, and isn't practiced all that much uh, because it's hard, it's hard work. Next slide, please. So 
supposing we managed to get all these people um, to understand each other's frames, um, the next the next thing we need to do is to try and position all of those people um, to support each other. So it's about inclusive positioning. It's about as a leader, you have to be following the dynamics of the conversation. You have to be understanding where all the different people are coming from, what sort of metaphors they're using to explain their point, what sort of frames they're using. And as a leader, you have to manipulate those frames so that they start to support each other and support a general moving forward. Um, and being aware of those people who are marginalized, whose voices aren't being heard, whose views aren't being heard. If you have a logging company CEO in the same meeting as an indigenous person, then there will be a power dynamic at work there, which will leave one of them marginalized. And the one who will be marginalized is the one with the least amount of power. Um, and it's those dynamics that in these very, very difficult conversations, as a leader, we need to be aware of and we need to take control of and reframe and bring those, reframe the, the conversation uh, that brings everybody into the picture and makes everybody included. Next slide, please. Um, so some of that, in order to do some of that, we require bridging work. And this, oddly enough, um, it was when we were doing the practice session yesterday. And um, it reminded me in 2019, I came to Up Noah and did a workshop um, with a, a, a whole range of people um, who came to take part in the workshop. And it was around this idea of the expert leader and getting taking the expert leader out of the equation um, because all of us are experts in our own field. And we come to any meeting uh, with that title of expert usually. Um, and there'll be people in the audience who are up and coming experts. And we have to get rid of that title and we have to get rid of the hierarchy in any, um, in any group in order for the framing, the reframing and all those other good things to happen. And the way that we were doing it and that my colleague and I have been working with um, since we came to the Philippines in 2019 is value added mapping. And the value added mapping exercise started with uh, the teams or individuals identifying a traditional piece of knowledge that was important to them. And they would introduce themselves through that piece of tech, through that piece of traditional knowledge. So once you take away people's titles and people's positions and what they do, and you focus on something that um, has an emotional attachment to it, such as traditional knowledge, you completely change the dynamic of the room and the dynamic of the group because people become interested in the tradition rather than what the role, what role the person has. And that then levels the playing field. In this particular case, uh, we have a disaster resilience planning exercise happening. Starts off very traditionally with people saying, well, this is what my group do, this is what my group do. And then we asked people to bring in their tech item. And we said, okay, so where, where would your traditional knowledge help in this situation? And in this particular case, it was a saffron flower. And from that, um, you can see that what was emerging from the conversation was about feelings as opposed to hard things. So there was things um, like consensus, sympathy and empathy. And I can't remember what the last one was now, um, but it starts to make the conversation more open, more inclusive and starts to change people's perspective. Because once you start bringing feelings into things, then you can start moving forward. All the time that we think a meeting is not about us, we, um, sorry, if all the time we start thinking of a meeting as being something that when we enter the meeting, we will exit, exit the meeting being exactly the same person and nothing will have changed. The meetings that are really productive are meetings that you go into and you come out of thinking, crikey, I'd never thought that. I'd never even thought about looking at this problem from this perspective. And those are the meetings that we should be having all the time. The meetings where we feel changed as a person when we come out of them. Next slide, please. 
And that's really about resonating. That's about when all of these things start bumping into each other and change you um, as a person and change the way that the group has operated. And therefore, more often than not, the solutions that arise. So it has to be about emotions as well. It can't just be about hard scientific fact. Um, emotions play an important part um, in anything we do. And that's where the ethical engagement comes into play. It's about ethics, it's about morality. And those are things that we too easily just move to one side because they're complex and they involve feelings and they involve us as a people and our values and beliefs. Next slide, please. So, although the VUCA world seems a very, very scary place, actually with vision, with understanding, with clarity around what a leadership role is, and it is not an easy role if we look at it in this new way, in this new frame, um, and agility, the agility, the ability to be able to move agilely uh, through conversations, uh, through meetings, in order to bring people together. I think we might have a chance in the future um, to come up with solutions to problems um, that are meaningful and are inclusive and co-creative of the people and the stakeholders who are involved. Next slide, please. So bringing all that together, leadership uh, for um, wicked problem solving. Um, we need to come from a constructionist perspective. We need to construct understanding uh, with everybody. It should never ever be just an individual leader's view. Um, which is a very hierarchical process. It has to be a process of co-creation, which takes time, trust, understanding, um, and continual reflection on the part of the leader. Um, it's not about necessarily the development of a person, but it's about the development of the practice that you engage in. Um, Competency at doing this is only partial, partially individually, individual. It's all about us being collective and situated in the problem that we are trying to resolve as a group. There's no universal recipe to do relational leadership, um, but competency grows um, as you learn to reflect and as you try different ways of engaging people, bringing people together, breaking down those hierarchies, trying to think about conversations in frames and how you can bridge those frames and how you can move people eventually to a point of mutual understanding as to what the problem actually is, not their individual stakeholder problem, but the overall problem that's being tried, trying to be solved. Um, and it's also about the ordinary, the everyday situations and conversations, uh, which come through from people's life experience and being able to feel included um, in those conversations. Next slide, please. And that's it, there's the references. So although it is no, um, I've not given any um, panacea uh, to uh, problems that we have with leadership and management at the moment, it is perhaps a way to think about how we discharge these duties um, as a leader and perhaps think through it from a relational perspective as opposed to a hierarchical perspective. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Grace. That was a very interesting and informative presentation. Um, we gained new knowledge and perspective on the Anthropocene Epic, how human activity substantially impacts the state of the planet. Um, most of our participants here are young scientists, researchers of different fields. And um, of course, uh, I think most of us or majority are of us study social systems. But um, I think human ecosystems is among the, ve the most complex um, or very complex area of study. <laughs> but understanding it is very crucial because it ultimately affects all human and non-human entities as you presented in your presentation, uh, such as our community and environment. As you have said, Dr. Chris, we need leaders that are aware of their actions, think people that think outside of their personal interests and seek the, the best situation for all. In addition, 
Uh, it is also important to know that all of us can also lead despite not being position leaders and despite the hierarchy, lead people to have better decisions and collective effort for the betterment of the community and the environment. Thank you once again. So up next, we will have our Q&A session. But before that, we have a few reminders for our participants. Uh, here at Zoom, kindly use the Zoom reaction button to raise your hand and wait for the host, me, to call your name and unmute you before speaking. For our FB, YouTube, and also to our Zoom participants, uh, you may also opt to send your questions via the chat box below. So now, I open the floor for a question and answer session. You can just um, raise your hand, uh, put your questions in the chat box. Okay. So now we have our first question from one of our Zoom participants. She asked, developing countries are the most, the most severely affected by accelerating climate change. But this is very disproportionate with their GHG emission contributions. That's true. How can global climate leaders encourage the developing countries to be effective actors? actors in fighting climate crisis <laughs> yes so um i come from a developed country um much to my shame actually um yes you are right developing countries are most severely affected by accelerating climate change and it is disproportionate um to the amount of um emissions that you contribute to the overall problem. Um, the problem lies with the Western world, to be quite frank. Um, and this is where we need some very serious conversations. Um, I think we were talking yesterday, there's a measurement of the bio, biodiversity um, of the planet that is capable of supporting human life uh, called global hectares. Um, if you look it up on the internet, you'll find a whole load of um, research about it. Um, and they uh, take the global hectares and they look at how much global hectares are available for each member of the uh, human population currently on the planet. And it comes out at 1.7. So um, uh, these, these global hectares include everything. Uh, biomass, uh, the waste we produce, how the how the uh, planet can absorb that waste and transfer it into usable um, uh, usable air or usable water, all of those things, and it comes out at one point seven. Um, China, uh, they uh, currently at their current rate are two global hectares per person. Uh, the UK is at something like five global hectares per person. And uh, America is approaching 10 hectares per person, global hectares per person. We are consuming and using too much of the Earth's resources in the Western developed countries. And we have to stop. But that requires us giving up things that we have become used to. And that's the crutch of the, that's the problem. There is very little that I think developing countries can do. And developing countries have every right to um, have their fair share of um, what is available on this planet to lead a good life, uh, to lead a life that is not composed of water stress, food stress, climate stress, or anything else. Um, and it's not your job, I don't feel, um, to solve that particular problem. I genuinely believe that the Western world has to um, give up uh, some of the vast share of the global resources that we are currently using. And I think Thank that's you. a big question. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that um, answer, Dr. Chris. Um, for me, the global hectares, um, that's a very uh, new, <laughs> new term. So uh, as we progress as, as researchers, we learn these new terms and global hectares is one of them. Um, so uh, from what I understood, global hect hectares does not, um, or is not really the actual hectares that 
humans need or individual humans need to live on but the but the um hectares in terms of resources that we need to to survive so as as you mentioned americans you need 10 hectares while china need two hectares uh i don't need the i don't believe the, the current earth that we live on as that um actual uh land to support no, us all it it's not land it's the uh, it's the biological capability available to each person so it's mm -hmm. not about actual land uh, and growing things it's the biological capability of the planet to support people um so that includes uh the the stuff we take out of the planet um the emissions that we produce uh the stuff that we don't put back into the planet apart from waste it's how it's how it's how much of all of that the planet can cope with Thank yeah. you for that, so, Doc Chris. Yeah, it, so it's really have... worth it's worth all of you looking it up. Um, it's only something I discovered. I think it was last week, actually, when I was putting together the module for my students. So I I also haven't done a lot of research into it, but just on the fit, it makes logical sense, and it's how uh, it's how they uh, calculate how many people the planet can sustain. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Dr. Chris. So we have uh, another question from our Zoom participant. She asks, would you have an opinion on which direction leadership styles and paradigms need to evolve to in order to meet the interdisciplinary nature of geo heritage conservation? Um, yeah, I mean, we need to move much more towards this relational leadership. We need to move away from hierarchical leadership Experts um, are part of the group. Um, they are not the leaders of the group. Um, and a leader's job is to build those trustful relationships between the group of people who are working on that particular problem. And I think from an interdisciplinary perspective, it's even more important um, that the leader isn't necessarily the expert, that the leader is somebody who can build those relationships and those relationship meshes that enable frank and honest conversation where people eventually reach a point of understanding each other's perspectives. Mm -hmm. Very much agree. Uh, Miss April, you're raising your hand. You may, not, you may now unmute. Hi, I just zeroed in on the idea earlier about uh, breaking hierarchies when when you know making decisions or in the meeting. Uh, I would I just remember the previous episode of Resilience Live with Doctor Opdyke, where he, um, where he determined archetypes for decision making through a serious game, uh, when address addressing flood hazard. I think you, Doctor Opdyke and Doctor Mortimer, more or less. Uh, support each other's, if I can use the term thesis statement, that you have to uh, move beyond hierarchies and see each other's perspective to uh, arrive at the most effective and the most comprehensive solutions for everything, basically. Mm -hmm. I just remembered it from the last episode. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think more and more people, um, the voice for relational leadership and for um, getting rid of hierarchies within meetings is becoming stronger. Um, it still has a big battle, I think, ahead of it. Um, but I think the more people who start seeing, because it can be very joyous, it can be very joyful uh, running those sort of meetings. They're hard work. But um, as a participant and as a leader of that group, you learn so much more and you build such better relationships. Um, yeah, it's um, but it's very different to the one world world way of thinking. I think it's a problem. Thank you yes. for that, Doctor yes. and Miss April. Uh, we have another question from our, from one of our participants here at Zoom. Miss Lord um, asks, what role can interdisciplinary collaboration? play in addressing the complex challenges facing Jira heritage preservation in the Anthropocene? And how can leaders facilitate such collaboration? Yeah, um, well, as I, um, as I was saying in the presentation, 
any problem we have, uh, geo heritage pres preservation um, specifically, I suppose, um, is a multidisciplinary problem. Um, you know, the, the stakeholders involved are, um, some of them are very, very powerful people. I mean, logging companies in America, so trying to protect ancient forest land in America, the logging companies are very powerful politically. Uh, they have a lot of, they have a very powerful political voice. They have a very powerful economic voice. Um, and the only way that we can get all these people together is with interdisciplinary collaboration. We, we need many, we need the arts, humanities. Again, in your um, opening film, um, somebody was talking about, it's not just about scientific communication. It's also about what the arts, what the humanities have to offer as well in terms of um, problem solving. Um, so at the moment, I haven't mentioned it in this presentation because we're still working on it, but there's a new framework that has recently been brought out um, by design, uh, the discipline of design, and it's called transition, transition design framework. And its application could be anywhere actually. Um, and it very much feeds into this multidisciplinary um, collaboration. And in terms of leadership of um, a transition design framework, it requires this relational way of thinking about leadership. And the facilitation is about understanding everybody's different viewpoints, the different frame that they are coming from, uh, the different picture they want you to see. And your job as a facilitator is to bridge all of those different frames to eventually bring people to a point where they understand each other and they can develop a co-created picture of what the problem is and how they want to move forward. I hope Thank that you helps. for that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's um, related to that, uh, engaging stakeholders. Um, an anonymous, anonymous participant asked, strategies can political leaders employ to engage with international organizations, NGOs, and other stakeholders in collaborative efforts to protect and promote geo heritage in the Anthropocene? Uh, this is related to your answer, but uh, she has an additional question. Um, how can developing countries like the Philippines adapt this national or community level? Sorry, how can how can a country like the Philippines? Yes, how can developing countries like the Philippines adapt this at national or community level? Sorry, adapt what? Um, the collaborative efforts. Um, at, uh, the collaborative efforts to protect and promote geo heritage in the Anthropocene. Uh, it's related to the different stakeholders uh -huh. uh, with, of course with any effort there are different stakeholders and uh, yeah. for a third world country the Philippines how can they yeah. adapt this at the national community level? okay so this actually is a really interesting question and it shows the power dynamics uh, so um, I'm sure the Philippines has uh, international companies uh, that um, come in uh, to do business, uh, maybe to set up factories or to farm land, perhaps, or grow, I don't know, cocoa. I'm not sure what your industries are, to be absolutely honest, but I'm absolutely positive there'll be international companies who buy into some of those things and they want profit. So I think the question you're asking is, how can a small de a developing country like the Philippines um, work with these very powerful international companies. Is that what the question is asking? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so um, this is where it's really important to understand. Um, I said back in one of the slides about the power, uh, the power that is being used by different groups. And international companies will be using the economic power. Uh, they'll be saying, but we're bringing money to your country. Um, so therefore, you must let us do this, this and this. And as a developing country, yes, international money is very valuable and it helps uh, improve people's way of life um, and helps provide education and all those other good things. 
this is the exact problem. This is the exact problem. It is a, at the root of it all, there is a social issue, which is that resources across the world are unfairly distrib distributed. So as a country, you have to be very clear what it is you want from these international companies. And that's difficult because it is, um, it, it, it's talking truth to power and big companies, economic, you know, um, multinational companies don't like it. They want money. So yes, it's, um, all you can do, all you can do is engage in these conversations and really try and understand the frame they are coming from and then try to bridge that to what you need. And that's why I was saying this, this type of leadership is very, very difficult because it is about breaking down those um, power structures. Mm -hmm. Agree, agree. Um, as with any relationship, may it be um, personal or business, communication and boundaries are very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So we, we move to the next question from Mr. Kyle Singson from EPL BNM. He asked, may me may we know if you have some specific suggestions on how geo heritage can help in climate change adaptation disaster risk reduction at the community level okay um so when i was asked to do this presentation geo heritage is not my area of expertise um by a long way and i had to do some research um about it all um, because I was like, what is geo heritage? You know, I've heard of um, archaeological heritage, so man made things that have, uh, were created in the past uh, that need to be protected for future generations. And I think, from my understanding as a layperson, um, geo heritage is the same thing. But again, it's about our mindset. We don't think of the planet as containing something that's worthy of being called heritage because it's the planet hey it's here we've it's here it we, we don't think about it so i think in terms of um disaster disaster risk reduction at community level some of these areas and um, particularly um uh, indigenous forest lands wetlands um all of those places they 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 have a knowledge in them, knowledge about how our planet was uh, before humans came to um, bring their own uh, footprint onto it. Um, and that helps us understand how things have changed and how they might move forward. Um, I think at a community level, it's also, there is probably also pride in these areas. Um, certainly in the Tongass National Forest, um, the local community has a huge pr pride in their forest um, and what their forest, what that forest provides them with. Um, presumably, I would imagine there are many traditional stories that are based on that forest, on that piece of land, uh, just as there probably are in the Philippines, if you're looking at somewhere that is ancient and is unspoiled at the moment. Um, so I think maybe it doesn't actually reduce disaster, but I think it increases resilience because the prouder people are of where they live and what they have in terms of uh, geological and um, environmental um, areas of special interest, uh, the more they will protect them. And the more you can protect them, then uh, the more resilient, I believe, um, the area will be. Mm -hmm. Good point, Dr. Chris. And I hope we can protect more areas here in the Philippines. Uh, Miss Miss Arch, uh, Miss Arch, would you would like to share Kimina on it? Uh, thank you, Dr. Morgan and um, Miss Ella. Uh, this is not a question, but I'd like to share something. So I'm a researcher from the UP Resilience Institute, and one of our functions is to communicate with Filipino leaders and communities and present maps to visualize how climate change may affect us in the future. From our models, we saw that climate change effects may actually vary per region in the case of the Philippines, but generally 
we expect that the hazards may worsen through time and uh people are actually terrified from from the results of these uh simulations and of course i'm sure after this uh session everyone is convinced that we need to take action against climate change but some of us may actually feel that our small efforts may not make a significant impact in the climate change situation uh, there's actually a concept called tragedy of the commons that describes a situation where individuals who share a common valuable resource um, often act based on self-interest which uh, which leads to over exploitation of, of of these resources and i hope before we end the session we don't uh we don't fall into this kind of thinking but actually mm -hmm. inspire more climate leaders in our own small ways mm -hmm. so that's yes. it thank you <laughs> yeah i think there is as with all things there's a very very delicate balance to be had between self-interest and um, a wider interest of the planet and again i think this is where it comes down to um a mindset change um we, we we don't think of the planet as being something that we need to take care of um that we we think it's there to service our needs um but it isn't i believe that we are custodians and guardians uh, of this planet because we are are we the most intelligent species on the planet apparently we are we, we we have technology we have science we have we have i mean as a species we are incredible really when you look at the way that we have moved forward in, in every aspect of our lives um but surely that should give us more of a duty to protect what we have globally for everybody and i think you're quite right we the world at the moment is in a, a is a, at a cusp. I think um, as human beings, we find it very difficult to get on with each other. Uh, we find it very difficult to move beyond self interest. Um, and also, Donna Haraway brought up this thing about there's either hope that technology will save us, or there is fear that it's too late. Um, but there is another way. We just have to. Um, look at the world uh, differently, I think. And I know that's not very helpful, but. Thank you for that, Ms. Arch and Dr. Chris. Uh, we have another participant who's raising her hand, Ms. Yunis, you may not unmute. Hi. Hello. Yes, Ms. Yunis. Awesome. Hi, Dr. Mortimer. I am um, I am an uh, uh, archaeology student from La Trobe University here, here in Melbourne. Um, and I just sort of, I guess one of my struggles, especially with talking about sort of pride in heritage and having that as, um, as the basis for um, sort of driving these uh, these conversations, um, especially as an archeologist where my role is to sort of show people their heritage and um, make sure that they're, they're interested in it, basically. I do find it quite difficult, um, especially for people from disadvantaged countries to become interested in those heritages, right? Um, especially since, you know, these people are living day to day, um, like their next care is um, is on those um, is on those sort of like uh, uh, priorities, as it were. And so my question is, how when you say when you say that it's sort of a leader that can um, sort of mesh these perspectives together, is it are some of these, um, like for instance, talking about pride um, in your heritage, would would you say that something like that should be um, less emphasized in these conversations then rather than sort of emphasizing um, what people need, as it were, like uh, mm -hmm. 
because like at the end of the day, um, try as we might to get people excited about these topics, it's always it's always difficult um, to talk to people who are you know um, who are struggling economically that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, yes, that you're quite right. I think um, the example of um, Tongass um, National Forest. So when you see the stakeholders there, you have uh, the logging companies, you have the loggers themselves, you have uh, local people, and there are also activist groups um, across America trying to save that particular ancient forest. Um, all of those people come from a very strong perspective and those perspectives are all equally as valid. Um, and it's, it's, how, it's how we bring those together to work out what a future is. I think one of the problems is we've got the present and the present is the present and you're quite right. Everybody lives the day to day uh, managing as best they can. And I think that managing the day to day as best you can is becoming more and more difficult um, as we move forward. Then the second point is we have to have some vision of the future. So there has to be some utopian thinking It's you know, what, what do we want to see in 20 years time? What do we want to see in 30 years time? And then once you have that, that joint future, once you've agreed between those stakeholders, okay, well, this is what we want in 10 years time, in 15 years time, in 20 years time. And then you can start unpicking all of those threads that live there because there is no one thread. There's no, you know, a logging company will say, I want to make more profit. Um, therefore, um, I'm going to log these trees, for example. Um, and somebody else will say, yes, but, you know, um, my family enjoy walking through this forest or, you know, these animals will lose their habitat and therefore we will lose these animals and they'll become extinct. That there are so many different threads and all of it comes down to social issues, ultimately. So it's the social issues that need to be resolved. But until we have some idea of what that future is going to look like, we, we can't solve the problems anyway. All we're doing is, is, is trying to replicate what we currently have um, in a more sustainable way. Um, there was an interesting article in the news today from the UK. They, fear, they think we're going to run out of electricity or we're going to start having massive blackouts in the UK from the year 2030. And it's because we've got nuclear power stations that are going to be um, decommissioned. Um, and new ones, and as yet, the wind farms aren't producing enough electricity. But because more and more people have got electric cars, it's, it's a bigger drain on the electricity that we can produce. So we've swapped one problem for another problem, basically. And that's all we're doing at the moment, is swapping one problem for another. Because we think the present is what we want in the future. But we need to think about what do we really want in the future? And I, I think that's what the problem is. Thank you, Doc Chris and Miss Denise for sharing. Um, we have another participant raising her hand, Miss uh, Miss April. You, you may not unmute. Hi, I just noticed something in the chat box. Uh, and it's garnering a lot of reactions. Let me just read this aloud. I think this is a very good point of view. Uh, thank you very much for this for this enlightening talk. Thank you for recognizing the role of the arts and humanities in addressing our pressing problems. I used the relational framework in my thesis about cinema that is drawn that is drawn from archipelagic thinking of Edgar Edward Glissant. Did I pronounce that right? A philosopher from Martinique and the Caribbean. It's fascinating to see how the concept has traveled and has been applied in this area. I think we can learn a lot from concepts and the theories and the humanities. As Dr. Mortimer said, the arts and humanities can provide different perspectives and solutions. I couldn't agree more to what Dr. Dr. Mortimer said about the need for a multidisciplinary approach addressing the challenges of our times. So I would like to thank Ms. Katrina Tan for that reaction. Thank, thank you, you. Ms. Katrina. Yes, Thank I completely you. agree. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Ms. Katrina, were you raising your hand? 
Okay. Siguro, <laughs> nag-react ko lang. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Miss Katrinata. Thank you for, uh, thank you today, Miss Do- uh, Dr. Chris. Thank you all to our participants uh, for actively participating in today's episode. Uh, we have received more questions, but due to limited time, we will need to close the question and answer session already. To those who were unable to ask their questions, you may send them to the UPRI Facebook page as messages and we will be forwarding them to Dr. Chris. Again, thank you to our speaker, Dr. Chris, for sharing your knowledge on leadership in the Anthropocene, in the age of Anthropocene. We'd also like to announce that our that all of our episodes, our previous and today's episode of Resilience Live, are available for viewing on the UPRI YouTube page. Of course, before we officially end today's episode, we would also like to request everyone to open your videos for a quick photo op. Please hold your smiles, everyone. <laughs> We're okay. We're okay now. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for thank you for that, Miss April, and thank you all for the very beautiful smiles. At this point in time, we now move on to the end of our webinar. Once again, the web this webinar has been brought to you by the UP NOAA Center and the UP Research Institute in cooperation with the UNESCO International Geoscience Program or IGCP. We would also like to thank again our partners, the Lyceum of the Philippines Laguna Biological Society, the UPLB Interdisciplinary Study Center for Integrated Natural Resources and Environment Management, or UPLB NREM, the Association of Filipino Forestry Students of UPLB, or APS UPLB, the UP Volcano Tectonics Laboratory, and the UP Rockhounds. Our next episode will be on March 21, 2024. So stay tuned on the UPRI Facebook page for announcements on our next speaker and featured topic. Please be reminded that participants will be issued a certificate of attendance once they have completed the evaluation form after the webinar. You may find the link to the form in the chat box below. Lastly, to our webinar participants, we will keep the Zoom meeting to allow participants to fill out the evaluation form. Thank you once again, Doc Chris, and to our participants. And as always, see you all at the next episode of Resilience Live. Once again, my name is Ella, and it has been a pleasure being your host this afternoon. Bye-bye! To all participants, please be advised that we will be closing the webinar in five minutes. Please make sure you have filled out the evaluation form. Thank you.